Jennifer Farr Davis. Um, again, thank you guys for coming out and thank you to the library. My family and I have been uh, on the road for four months now. So four months driving around with a five-year-old and a one-year-old and we still mostly like each other. <laughs> and this is our penultimate event. We have an event tomorrow in Pittsburgh and then that sort of concludes this big four-month book tour that we've been on. So almost there. <laughs> Save the best for last. Save the best for you guys. Um, if you got drug along, or maybe you're not quite sure what this program is about, um, we're going to talk about trails and endurance. And I love trails. They're my favorite place. I love hiking, backpacking, running, picnicking with my kids, throwing rocks. We do a lot of that. We forage, we look for animals. It really doesn't matter how I'm out there, how far I'm going, or what pace I'm going at. I'm really happy when I'm on a trail. And I've been fortunate enough to hike um, or travel over 14,000 miles of long distance trails on six different continents. Uh, I've hiked actually with my daughter, who is shy tonight, which again, she's the most extroverted one in the family. So that is uh, interesting, but we've been on a trail in all 50 states with our daughter. Um, she was carried for most of those hikes. It's funny, when you hike a long trail, it's pretty common to take a nickname or what hikers call a trail name. And my daughter, since the time she was one, her trail name has been Hold Me. <laughs> it's very appropriate. Um, but my favorite trail, out of all the places I've hiked, my favorite trail, and for many reasons, is the Appalachian Trail. So I am always curious, especially when we're not on the East Coast, how many folks here in Ann Arbor have been on the Appalachian Trail? That is a big number. Probably why you came to the program tonight. That's great. Has anyone in here completed the trail? That's awesome. That's really rare to have three completers. Would you guys share your trail names? Do you mind? Sure, I'm persistent. Persistent, I love it. That's good. Skid. Skid, won't ask. <laughs> Paradox, I met your mom two days ago. Yep, that's fun. Okay, so these are the idea of how we would introduce ourselves on the trail. We would use these trail names. Um, my trail name is Odessa. I got it on my first hike of the Appalachian Trail. When I got out there the first week, I'm, I'm very tall, I'm six feet tall. So the first suggestions I received for a trail name included Sasquatch, Amazon, and Stretch. And all of a sudden, all the old wounds from middle school were ripped open. Um, so I didn't like those, but I was comparing the trail to Homer's Odyssey. And someone said, what about the trail name Odysseus? And I really liked that. Um, but I was proud to be a, a single female out there and wanted a feminine trail name. So we changed it to Odyssa, and I've been Odyssa on every trail since. So yes. Um, the Appalachian Trail is my favorite, and I've done it three times, and it was the most recent time in 2011, which that's not that recent anymore, but pre-kids, which that feels like a lifetime ago, I went out there with Brew's help. Uh, he was assisting me, meeting me at road crossings, bringing me food and gear. I finished the trail in 46 days, and that is an average of 47 miles a day. And that is crazy, right? <laughs> what I've learned on this book tour um, is you can't start with, with crazy. I tried for a while, but it turns out you gotta build your credibility. So I'm gonna briefly tell you how I fell in love with trails and why I even wanted to try for a record. Because I did not grow up hiking or backpacking or camping. And there is no youth league for trail records or fastest known times. But um, I think one of the things I love the most about hiking is it's never too late in life to find the trail and they can meet you at any phase of life. I met a really great example of that actually this spring. I was backpacking on a path in Alabama called the Pinhoti Trail. And I met a guy, his trail name is Nimble Will Nomad. He's hiked over 40,000 miles of long distance trails and the catch is he didn't even get started until after he turned 60. Wow, 
that guy is my hero. But I found trails when I was 21. And at that point, I had just graduated from college, so I had this fantastic liberal arts degree and absolutely no clue what it was I was gonna do with my life. So I wanted time and a place to figure things out. And I also, quite frankly, just wanted to spend time outside. It struck me at that point that very little of my life or my education had taken place outdoors and I knew very, very little about nature. And that bothered me. But growing up in North Carolina, I'd always heard of the Appalachian Trail and I thought, you know, that, that is gonna be my adventure. And uh, if you're hiking the entire trail, and, and for the few of you in here who haven't been out there, um, the Appalachian Trail is 2,190 miles long. It goes through 14 states between Georgia and Maine. And if you're trying to hike the whole thing and not going for a record, how long do you think it's gonna take you? Too long. <laughs> A long time. How long did it take? Were, were you guys through hikers or section hikers in here? Through. through? How long did it take y'all? Six. Six? Five. Five? Seven. Seven. There you go. That's the range right there. Um, it, Good to go. Yeah. Um, so six months is, is about average. You'll meet folks who do it in four or eight, but five or six months is pretty normal. And when I was out there the first time, it took me five full months. And when I got to the end, I was very, very different. Um, the trail had changed my values. At the end, I valued simplicity. I realized I could be very content with just the items I carried in a pack on my back. And that feels very Spartan, but actually it's incredibly liberating. When you realize you don't need stuff or things to be happy, you can invest in experiences and adventures. And, um, you know, I wanted to learn about nature and from nature out there, and I did. There was a lot of self discovery. But I think one of the things I underestimated was how much I learned from other people. And that's actually the criticism or the knock on the Appalachian Trail if you're comparing them to other long trails. In the US or the world, people say the Appalachian Trail is too crowded. That's what they say. There's too many people out there. I don't buy it. I can always find solitude, even hiking in what, what they call the herd of through hikers. If you start early, if you hike late, if you go your own pace, you'll find solitude. But the spin on that, the upside of the people using the trail is, in my opinion, the Appalachian Trail is the most community-centric path that I've hiked. I like that you meet people out there. I like that you don't know who's around the next turn. And it's very user-friendly, so it's not just long-distance hikers, it's day hikers, weekenders, and in fact, the trail was never built to be hiked all at once. The founders didn't think it was possible. So, Everyone can use the trail. One way is not better than the other. But all the numbers, all of them are going up. And last year, um, over 5,000 people started the Appalachian Trail hoping to finish it. And that's called a through hike when you're trying to do it in a calendar year. But of 5,000 folks who started, how many do you think actually made it to the end? Twenty more than that? No, more than that. Um, north, of, just north of a thousand. So usually the finishing rate usually hovers around twenty-five percent, or one in four. I'm really curious about what it's going to be this year because it has been so wet. It's been so sloppy. It's been a very tough year to hike the whole trail. Um, but yeah, one in four usually make it. But here's the thing. I want you to know this you would be surprised at who makes it. It is not always the fittest. It is not, hear me on this too, it is not the person who spent the most money at REI. <laughs> Don't be that person, they usually do not make it. Um, do you wanna guess, this is just mind boggling, but do you wanna guess the youngest completer of the Appalachian Trail? Five. 
Five was right until last year. There have been three five-year-olds who have hiked the whole thing with their families. Last year, there was a mom and a dad who did it with their one-year-old. Now, granted, remember I said completed the trail, not hiked the trail, right? So she was carried. The mom or dad would carry her on their back, and the other would carry the gear. And it took them longer than average, but they made it. Yeah. There was also an 82-year-old who did it last year. In the past, there have been multiple legally blind hikers who have finished with their CNI dogs. And a few years ago, there was a woman with a prosthetic leg who did the whole thing. So you never know who you're going to meet, and you can't be sure who will finish. But I will, I also like to add, um, because it was very important to me on my first through hike, usually the two main demographics you see hiking the whole trail are folks right out of school and then individuals who have recently retired. Two good times in life to take a six-month hike. Also, a really great combination. There is such an exchange of energy, that's what we'll call it, energy and wisdom when you have these recent grads and retirees. And I spent a lot of miles, a lot of time hiking with folks in their 60s and 70s. And they had a lifetime's worth of experience and on the trail they had time to share their stories. And on multiple occasions, one of them would turn to me and share his or her biggest regret in life. And whenever that happened, I thought, man, that's an education. That's more valuable than anything I learned in school. And the trail offers you that. It offers you that wisdom. But it also offers time alone. And I realized I love that too. And that surprised me. Because when I started, I was terrified to be alone. I was worried about my safety because, quite frankly, everyone else was worried about my safety. <laughs> but I got over that pretty quickly. Once I got to know the reality of the trail and began meeting the people out there, I wasn't worried about my well-being. But for a while, I held on to this fear of being bored and lonely. Thought, man, I'm going to be out here a long time with nothing to do but hiking. And I remember the first day I felt bored on the trail. It was several weeks in, and I was by myself, so there was no one around. And you know, I just realized I could, I could hike, but I didn't have to hike. And it was the first time in my life that I started to process there was no need to react or respond or produce or meet someone else's expectations. And that was weird. That was awkward and at first uncomfortable. And the more I got used to this boredom and loneliness, the more I realized it was awesome. It was awesome. It was the first time in my life I experienced true peace. And man, man, just talking about it now, what I wouldn't give as a working mom of two to feel bored <laughs> has not happened in a long time. And it's not offered in our everyday society. But on the trail, you can find it. And in those times alone, I learned what made me cry with no hope of sympathy, what made me laugh with no one else around. And as much as I valued the community when I got to the end, I realized I was a much better part of community when I also was comfortable being by myself. And I just love that balance on the trail. But the thing I missed the most when it was over, so I finished and I got off and I got a job and that made my mom incredibly happy. <laughs> But what I missed was strange because I missed how beautiful I felt on the trail. And when I was out there, I was filthy, covered in dirt and scrapes and bug bites and bruises. And also, if we want to compare trails, out of all the ones that I've hiked, you smell the worst on the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> But that's not, that's not the point. The point. The point is, for five months, I did not carry a mirror. And I know this dates me, but it was before the age of the selfie. So I wasn't taking digital pictures of myself the whole way. I didn't see myself that way. I also didn't have billboards or magazines or commercials telling me what I should look like. 
So I started to see myself through interactions with other hikers. And if I was kind, if I made someone else smile, that was my reflection. That made me feel pretty. And growing up, I had always thought that nature was beautiful. And usually, it was looking out a window. I had never seen myself as a part of nature. I had never seen myself as a part of all that beauty until I hiked. And then after hiking over 2,000 miles and coming through 14 separate states, you better believe that I based my self-worth a whole lot less on how I looked and a whole lot more on what I could do. And hiking the Appalachian Trail made me realize that I could do so much more than I once thought was possible. So now I wanted to do more. What is one thing you think I wanted to do more of? Hike. Hike, yeah. Do you guys want to do more hiking? Are you good? No? You all want to do more? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's the good part about trails and the dangerous part. One trail leads to another and another, and pretty soon you realize there are trails everywhere, all over the US, all over the world. Most of them are free to access. In my opinion, hiking is the most affordable, universal, and best way to travel. Sometimes my husband disagrees with me. <laughs> we actually, um, we had our 10 year anniversary while we were on book tour and that was very exciting, but we also have not had a babysitter in four months. So we're hoping we can do something to celebrate this fall. And the one thing Brew has asked is that we please do not hike for our anniversary. <laughs> so we'll see, jury's still out. But um, yeah, I thought it'd be fun to share with you guys some of my favorite hiking pictures from different trails all around the world. Um, so we'll start the journey in Africa at Mount Kilimanjaro. Rise and fall like the tide, my hand moves with your chest. Just before. 
hope you guys enjoyed some of those photos. Any of you been to any of those places? Did it look familiar? Some places? Um, I like to pause for a minute here because I want to keep going and um, share stories and talk about records and all those good things. But we've already covered a lot of ground, right? We've been in here 20 minutes. We've hiked the Appalachian Trail once, been around the world. Good job, team. <laughs> You'll be hungry afterwards. Um, do we have any questions before I continue? Does everything make sense? Is there anything you need to know logistically, practically? Do I know Heather Anderson? I'm fortunate enough to know Heather Anderson, and she is awesome. And in the new book, The Pursuit of Endurance, um, she's included. She has her own chapter. And depending on how much time we have at the end, I might be able to talk a little bit about her as well. But she's awesome. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Did you have any injuries along the way or anything? That you, I mean, you talked about bruises and mm -hmm. things. Most of the injuries were minor in what you would expect, like a twisted, um, a twisted knee or a sprained ankle or bee stings. And that is um, relatively serious for me because I'm moderately allergic to bees. Um, little bits of poison ivy or poison oak here or there. But really, again, what you would expect. Um, I actually think the greatest risk right now probably for hiking the Appalachian Trail is um, contracting Lyme disease from ticks. That would be my number one concern if I was out there right now. Um, so there are all those factors, but for the most part, I'll be honest, I, I feel um, the healthiest when I am on the trail. I just feel good. It's like I'm doing what I was made to do. And I think in a lot of ways, Many people feel that because um, as humans, we've sort of evolved to be outdoor movers. You know, we come from this long line of people who were hunters and gatherers and nomadic and working in fields and our turn to sedentary cubicle screen lifestyles is very recent. Um, and we have not adjusted or adapted to that yet. And so when we go outside and when we move and use our bodies, um, it lights up something that um, I think is both you know, spiritual and, and evolutionary in our systems. Yeah. You're from Asheville, right? Yeah. Do you have a favorite um, excuse me, trail in the area? Um, so I grew up in Western North Carolina, and I still live there. And I have a lot of favorite trails. I do hit the Appalachian Trail a lot, but not typically when through hikers are coming through because it's busier or in October because there's a lot of people out there looking for fall colors. So usually I'll go on the Mountains to Sea Trail, which is also a long trail. It's 1,200 miles um, across the state of North Carolina, but there's 80 miles that just runs through the heart of Asheville and goes on either side. So I'll hike on that a bunch. Um, that's sort of my go-to trail in Asheville. It's a good question. Yeah, one more and then we'll keep going. So most of these traditional backpacking trips, and really everything we've talked about so far, almost all of it, I did it solo on my own, and it was all traditional backpacking trips where I'm carrying all my own gear with me. Um, I relied a lot on the fact that I had grown up playing sports um, and always enjoyed physical fitness and, and being in decent shape. Um, I've always been somewhat of a recreational runner. I played tennis in college. Um, I'm, I like mowing the yard. I mean, I've always had some type of, you know, basic level of fitness. Um, the lowest it's ever been has actually been after becoming a mom. So <laughs> I relied a lot on that, that background. And still, the trails, every time I got on a trail, it was humbling. Like, I just felt like every time I overestimated my ability and underestimated the trail. And I think the main mistake people make going out there is trying to push too hard too quickly or else carrying too much gear. And it increases your risk of in injury um, and decreases your enjoyment starting out. So when you start, I always recommend um, only carrying what you need, not including any luxury or extra items in your pack, and then also just starting slow and easing into it. So now let's segue into records, right? Perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think one of the last things I mentioned um, before we watched the photos is 
You know, the Appalachian Trail really instilled in me this sense that I could do more, I wanted to do more, and my life didn't necessarily have to look the way I thought it would before I started hiking. Um, and that opened me up to doing other trails, but honestly, it, it also made me want to do more with my life off trail and do different things than I once thought about. And, and a big thing that this encouraged me to do was actually at the age of 24, after several of these long trails, I started my own hiking company because this had been the most empowering thing I had ever experienced. It had been the best education I had ever had. And I just thought, man, if I could help other people get outdoors, that would be time really well spent. So I quit my job and I started Blue Ridge Hiking Company and I figured if it didn't work, I would go back to grad school. And that is still my plan 10 years later. <laughs> but we are fortunate now we get over a thousand people out on the trails each year in Western North Carolina. And a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are beginners, which I really love. Um, so that was the positive thing that happened. And around that time, I also uh, fell in love and got engaged and married Brew, and that was also very positive. And all these good things were happening off trail, and I had less time to go and hike. But I still loved it, obviously. I still wanted to do more. And I actually told Brew, it was on our first date, I said, you know, if I could do one more big trail, the one I would want to do is to go back to the Appalachian Trail and hike it again. And even on our first date, when you're really trying to impress the other person, <laughs> he had no interest in doing that with me. Uh, but he was, um, for most of his career, now we work together, but he was a public school teacher. And it was later on, he came up with the idea. He said, well, I don't want to hike the trail with you, but I don't want to be apart for six months, so maybe we could take the summer months and I could help you down the trail. And that sounded awesome to me. In retrospect now, I know he also was planning to try to visit every craft brewery within about <laughs> 30 miles. He didn't share that originally. Um, but yeah, for me, I thought, wow, I'll get to experience the trail. I'll get to share it with my husband. And I had, I had always heard about these records on the Appalachian Trail. But everyone I knew of had been set by a man. And there was not a woman's record. And I thought, well, if I have support, and I really do, I, I love hiking all day. I like pushing my limits. And if I don't get injured, then maybe I could establish a women's record. So I went out with Brew in 2008, and with his help, I finished the trail in 57 days, and I established a women's record. I averaged 38 miles a day. And it was the most unsatisfying finish <laughs> to any trail that I've ever hiked. But the question, the question is why? Why did I get to the end and feel disappointed? What do you think? That is part of it. Um, yeah, that is part of it. I will be the first to admit you are going to miss out on things doing the trail in 57 days that you experience at five months. The thing I missed the most was the community. I didn't have the flexibility or the time to meet someone and stay with them for several hours or several days. And I missed it. On the other hand, you will experience things and find things doing the trail in 57 days that you will not get doing it in five months. They are very different animals. They both have different advantages and disadvantages. Doing the trail in 57 days, um, the best and the worst part <laughs> was doing it with my husband. It was. It was hard. It was the only time I had, or up until then, the only time I had started a trail, and then I was also committed to finishing the trail with the same person. And no, we are not hiking every mile together. We would hike a little bit together each day. But having that support and having that teamwork was really difficult. We say, we both say, and we were newlyweds when we went out and did this, and, and we'll say, man, we worked a lot on what we call communication that summer. And then Brew and I have taken an oath not to share any more about it publicly because it was hard. But when I got to the end, um, you know, we had grown a lot closer together because of it. 
And um, I was really grateful that I could share the trail I loved the most with the person I loved the most. And that was, it was the best part and it was the hardest part. One thing that surprised me is I thought trying for a record, I would need to go a lot faster. And in the beginning, I tried to go faster. And the Appalachian Trail really doesn't let you go fast. I would try to hike faster or run, and I would just always slow down very quickly. And what I found is I could get my miles and feel better by just starting early and hiking and being consistent and efficient and then ending late in the day. So I increased my mileage not by speed but duration of time hiking on the trail each day. And while I was out there, I would think about, you know, previous trails that I had done, and I thought about some of my friends on other trails and people who I had finished near. And no offense to the guys in here, but I will say guys at the end of long trails usually look horrible. <laughs> they do. Usually they're emaciated, um, and then they're scruffy, and half of them are hunched over, and I have not figured that out. But women at the end of long trails don't look that way. Women at the end of a long trail, their calves will be out to here, and they are felt, but they look strong, and to me, they all look like they can keep going. And you know, ladies, I mean, usually we hate this, but we hold on to our weight better than the guys. Um, and when you're going over 2,000 miles, it's a good thing. Maybe no other time, but when you're going over 2,000 miles, it's a good thing. We also have lower daily caloric and hydration needs, and that can help when you're carrying all your own gear and food and provisions. And we've evolved to carry the weight of pregnancy and also give birth. So because of that, we are champs at carrying packs. We are built for it. Our hips are awesome for shouldering weight. And I read this whole tedious academic essay about how a woman's feet will flatten out better under the additional weight of 30 pounds than a man's. Plus, and then you got to figure, like, our pain threshold is pretty darn high, too. Right? <laughs> right? So anyways, I was having this realization that I didn't have to go fast to get my miles. I didn't need to have big muscles. And by the time I got to the end, I was really <laughs> frustrated because I knew that I had limited myself from the beginning. Because in my mind, there were two categories. There was a men's record and there was a women's record. And I thought I was going to be lucky to be within a week or two at the men's mark. And I pretty much hiked accordingly. And I really hate it off trail, where I feel <laughs> limited due to my gender or background or something that I can't control. And then I realized I had done it to myself on trail. And when I got to the end, now a small part of me thought I might have what it would take to set the overall record. So the next few years, um, I worked hard. I did shorter trails, more traditional backpacking. But when Brew and I started talking about beginning our family, that is what sent me back to the trail. It became very clear to me that even though I had always wanted to be a mom, and I hoped I could be a mom, before giving not just my time, but my body over to motherhood. It felt really significant for me to find out what my body could do apart from that. So I asked Brew, and he agreed to help me one more time on the trail. And in 2011, we went back, and this time my goal was to try to set the overall record. And we started in Maine. Why do you think we wanted to do that? Yeah, exactly. So people who have hiked the trail usually will nail this. Um, and no one said downhill, so good job, Ann Arbor. You pass. Um, <laughs> Maine and New Hampshire, they are the toughest two states. Just really steep climbs, a lot of scrambling, and the most miles above tree line. And I didn't want that looming over me the whole way, so I thought, let's get that out of the way in the beginning, but it makes it an extra tough start. And I began up there, and on day four, I was going down this steep mountain, on, which was basically just a granite slab, and I noticed this sharp pain develop in my lower right leg, so I compensated, and I kept going, and within a few hours, I felt the identical pain developing in my lower left leg, and by the end of that day, I had full-blown shin splints. 
And the pain was so intense, which by the way, if you have shin splints and if you're hiking with shin splints, going uphill is excruciating. Going downhill is unbearable. So I would reach the top of a mountain, make it to a summit, and then turn and hike or scramble downhill backwards. It's the only way I could keep going. Yeah, I literally hiked into New Hampshire backwards. So I like waved to Maine. You know, I was like, bye bye, see you later. But in New Hampshire, I was praying for good weather because it has the longest stretch of trail above tree line. And when I got there, I had 36 hours of rain followed by a sleet storm the last week of June. Um, Ice storm, yeah, it was really bad. One of the worst I've ever been in. And going through the ice storm, I actually became pretty hypothermic, um, which I had great gear and extra food, but I was pretty depleted at that point. And also after a day and a half of rain, either water gets into your clothes or sweat doesn't get out. And the only reason I think I was able to continue past that storm is because my husband, who always met me at road crossings, he assumed there had been bad weather. So he took the initiative to pack up our gear and hike in as far as he could and set up the tent. So I came off this icy ridge, I got to our tent, climbed inside, crawled into two sleeping bags and shivered for 30 minutes. That was all I could do. Then when I started to relax, I ate a ton of food and put on dry clothes, some of which were my husband's because I didn't have enough. And then I, I tried to keep going. And after that, I had these strange side effects from the hypothermia. I was extremely lethargic. And then I also was um, swollen. Uh, my body was just retaining water and bloated. Every, my fingers were swollen, my toes, my legs. At one point, uh, this might be TMI, but my husband looked at me and he was like, the only part of you that's not swollen is your chest. And I was like, you think that's what I need to hear right now? <laughs> but it was, all, it was all very weird and I felt horrible. And you know, for that, that day and a half when I had these symptoms, um, I wasn't really sweating, I wasn't using the restroom re regularly. And it stayed like that into Vermont. And my first day in Vermont, uh, because of all that or on top of it, I got really sick. So now, now I'm behind record pace. I'm depleted, dehydrated, running off into the bushes and struggling to go a mile per hour. And when I finally came stumbling out to the next row crossing, Brew was waiting there for me, and I looked at him with tears streaming down my face, and I said, we are done. We're done with the trail and done with the record, and all I want to do is go home. And he looked at me, and here's what he said. He said, if you really want to quit, that's fine. But he said, you just can't quit right now. He said, right now, you feel too bad to make a good decision. So I want you to keep going until tomorrow night. And tomorrow night, if you still want to quit, I'll take you home. So he said that, and then he drove off. <laughs> I mean, he made sure I had what he needed, but then he drove off very quickly. And it's hard to quit without a ride. <laughs> so, uh, so I continued. and and. For hours, nothing changed. I was literally just making plans for what we were going to do with the rest of our summer, now that it had opened up. And eventually, the medicine kicked in, and I could hold in a little food and a little water. And at that point, still, no part of me thought I could set the record. I mean, I fully believed it was long gone. But for the first time in a while, I now started to think, well, maybe, maybe I could keep going if I really wanted to. So then I had a decision to make, and that was, you know, am I out here for the record? Because at the beginning, and when I trained for 10 months, I thought I was going for the record. But when it was no longer an option, what I realized is I wanted something different. It wasn't the most important thing for me to be the best, but it was deeply important for me to find my best. And I wanted to be able to move on and embrace 
a different season of life and a different adventure and a different pace of life and be able to look back and not have any unanswered questions or regrets. And I felt like if I could keep going, then I didn't have my answer. So I chose to continue, but not for the record. I wanted to find my best. And when I decided to keep going and let go of this idea of the record, I realized how oppressive the record had been. I mean, up until that point, I was just demoralized. And I was always focusing on what I wasn't doing. And I was mostly also focusing on numbers, miles per hour, miles per day, or where the current record holder was. And that was absurd, because he'd set the record years before. So he's at home drinking beer. But in my mind, I see the guy like every day. I'm like, oh, yeah. But when I let go of the comparisons and the numbers and stopped waking up each morning with these daunting expectations, and instead I would wake up and ask myself, well, what can I do today? When that psychological shift occurred, what do you think happened to my miles? Up, right, that. What do you think happened to my enjoyment? Up. Yep, that's when it became our hike, my hike, our adventure, really. Up until then, I was running someone else's race, and it was not fun. But from that point forward, Brew and I agreed that we wouldn't focus on the numbers or talk about the numbers more than we needed to. He still kept track of them in the car. But at the road crossing every day, he would say, well, just do your best and leave it all out on the trail. So that became my focus and my mantra. And I really feel like for the next 36 days until the end, I was able to do it. And when we got to the finish, it was interesting. I've been thinking so much about this recently because we're at the end of our book tour. And for months, I've been like, man, I can't wait to get home. Man, I can't wait to have a babysitter. Man, I can't wait to have clean laundry. And now it's almost over, and I'm really sad. And my daughter's starting kindergarten in three weeks, and I feel like a basket case. And that, that's a lot like how it was at the end of the Appalachian Trail. For so long, I dreamed about that last mountain, and then I got there, and I was heartbroken. It was over. And I realized I had gotten to live a dream. And I could stand on that last mountain and say, I have my answer. And this is my best. And I know I could have never hiked the trail in 46 days alone. And I was able to be more than myself and accomplish more than I could on my own because the person who meant the most to me was standing there beside me and he had been with me the whole way a lot like this book tour. <laughs> and that was the reward. That realization amid the flood of emotions, that was the reward at the end of the trail. And it was a bonus that we set the record. And do you want to guess, this is a little surprising, do you want to guess one of the best days of being a record holder? Getting a Coca-Cola at the gas station? Yeah, it's funny. Day one is great. Day one, it's a little loopy, but you did it, and you're there. And um, yeah, strangely, I did not. I had had to eat so much that summer to keep going. I had no interest in food when I got to the end. I slept. I slept for about two days and then woke up on day four, and that was a good day because it's like, oh, yay, we did it. <laughs> But then, four years later, um, when someone else broke our record, there was a little bit of sting to it. Um, and I will, I will add to that, you know, records are made to be broken. And the guy who, who eventually broke our record is a really, you know, fine fellow. But the thing I take issue with is he only broke our record by three hours. Yeah. But just like, if you're going to break a record, break it good, you know, <laughs> like, break it by 12 hours. Don't make me rethink every stop along the way. Um, but I also remember finding out that, you know, this guy had been successful. And I, I remember feeling this sense of warmth and fullness after a brief moment of, you know, disappointment. I, I felt like nothing has changed. And all the lessons from that summer and all the memories and, you know, the way I grew in my relationship with my husband, it was all still there. 
and it was all still ours. And that was a really wonderful moment because it was then I realized it would never change and no one would ever take it away from us. And, you know, the reason I've been writing about trails for a long time, and I actually wrote a book about our record. It's um, titled Called Again, and it goes very in depth about that journey. And the reason I wrote the new book was not because seven years ago I set a record on the Appalachian Trail. The reason I wanted to write this book is because, quite frankly, <laughs> um, I have not done one 40-mile day since 2011, since setting that record. And now most of my time is directed towards work and family. And to stay in shape now, I, I still love going for hikes. Um, I'll still run, but usually it's just two or three times a week, and I'll maybe make it three to five miles. And, and if I get to the end and have not peed on myself, it is a huge success. So I am not the athlete I once was, and yet I use the lessons of hiking 47 miles a day all the time. All the time. It's just a different application. And now it's, it's not sleepless nights because of you know, physical performance, it's sleepless nights because one of my kids is sick. Or they don't have to be sick, they're kids. They just don't sleep through the night sometimes. Or it's applied when I have a work deadline that I don't think there's any way I can meet. Or it's the lessons we learned in support. And now it's supporting a friend who's going through a divorce or going to chemo. And I think about the trail daily. And the lessons of endurance, what, I, what I've come to believe is that, you know, endurance is endurance. It really doesn't matter if it's phys physical, emotional, or, or mental. The tools and the mindset is the same. So I thought, wouldn't it be useful slash um, powerful to go around and not just offer my story, but interview some of these experts of physical endurance on trail, folks who have done things that no one else have, and folks who have set records on different paths, and ask them about their adventures, because they're really, they're fun to hear about, but way more than that, what I wanted was to find out what they learned, how it's helped them in their life off trail, and how it could help someone else. So I spent two and a half years doing research for the book, and I also interviewed an expert physiologist and sports psychologist, but to me, it's so captivating um, and useful about this book are the individual stories and the people in here who are willing to share their lowest moments on and off trail and what got them through. So the folks in here, um, and we don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll give you a brief bio for each person, and then you guys can choose your own adventure. I'll give you a little bit more information about one of them, okay? So the folks you'll meet in this book, the first is a man named Warren Doyle. He is right now on the trail working on his 18th completion of the Appalachian Trail. He set one of the first records in the 70s, and he's the only person I know to hike the John Muir Trail, or any trail, eating only Little Debbie brownies <laughs> the whole way. And he lost weight. Um, the, next, the next fellow is a man named David Horton. He's the godfather of ultra running in the US. He, um, has won some really big races, set a record on the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and he has run across America. He's also, despite having logged over 113,000 lifetime miles, the only person I know who's had septuple bypass surgery. And now, because he can't run, he bikes. He bikes. Um, <laughs> one of the more interesting interviews in here um, was with Andrew Thompson, and it was interesting because he, well, A, he's very interesting, and B, he had the record that I broke. And at one point during our interview, there I am sitting in his living room asking about his experience, and he brought out a gun, and that made it super intense. Um, and you'll have to read about that. Obviously, it worked out okay, but... <laughs> Um, he's also one of the handful of finishers of the 100 mile Barkley ultra marathon, which is considered to be the toughest ultra race in the world. 
Now I'll admit, I, there is a person in here I was the most excited to interview. It is a fellow named Scott Williamson. I'm so glad his story is a part of this project. I didn't think I would get to talk to him because he, until, this, until this book, he had not done an interview since 2003. Um, but I got to talk to him because in 2006, I actually met him on the Pacific Crest Trail. I was coming out of a bad storm. He was going into it. And I knew I was nearing a road, and I was going to go into town and resupply. And so I took off my pack, figuring the storm would throw him off his schedule. And I dug inside and gave him all the food I had left, which was like a few measly energy bars. And 12 years later, <laughs> those energy bars got me an interview with Scott Williamson. So... <laughs> excited. It pays to be nice and hikers never forget food. Um, but he is, he has a total of something like 55 or 60,000 lifetime miles. And most of them have been completed with a bullet lodged in his spine. Um, the, the next person in the book, um, also one of my favorites is someone you already mentioned, Heather Anderson. Just to give you an idea of what Heather Anderson is doing this year, um, she's hiking the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail and the even longer Continental Divide Trail. Yeah. So roughly 7,000 miles of hiking, and she's doing it all in a calendar year. Yeah. And then the final guy in here um, is pretty well known. He's the one who broke my trail record. His name is Scott Jurek. And he's probably, um, you know, the most decorated ultramarathoner in North American history. So, out of those folks, who do you want to hear about? Carl Mexter. Carl? He's not in the book. You don't get to hear about him. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about Warren Doyle. Oh, Warren. Okay. Um, have you met him? No. I just learned about him through you. Oh, well, if you've learned about him through me, you probably have a, a fairly favorable opinion of him. Um, if you've learned about him through other people, it might not be as favorable. Um, so Warren Doyle is the one on the trail right now working on his 18th completion. He's in his late 60s. He's been a part of the history of the Appalachian Trail for over 40 years now. And people have very, he's a very polarizing character. A lot of people do not like Warren Doyle at all. Um, which is in some ways surprising to me because he's extremely temperate. I've never heard him raise his voice. I've never heard him curse. He does not drink. He does not smoke. Um, his side hobby, apart from hiking, is going to contra dances, which is basically a form of, of folk line dancing. But he really pisses people off. <laughs> he really ticks people off. And, and he is a self-described agitator, and part of it, he is always asking questions. He is always asking questions, and he will question um, conservation groups along the trail and their policies and regulations. He will question land management, like Forest Service and national parks. He questions government, which isn't so um, uncommon anymore. Um, questions religion and military. That's gotten him in a lot of trouble. And so, you know, in interviewing Warren, and I've known him the longest, I've known him, I took a class from him before my first through hike. It was a four day class to prepare for the Appalachian Trail. And that was in December, 2004. And now 14 years later, my little girl dresses up in pink princess dresses and he'll take her contra dancing. So it's been a long relationship with Warren. And we've had our ups and downs. Um, but one of the things I was interested about in this research was why he was an agitator and why he was a questioner. And uh, one of the first things I learned about him is I thought he, had, he was an only child. And he said that actually when he was young, he had a sister and they were very close and she was a year and a half older than he was. And he says up until middle school, he had just been a very average kid and tried to always stay in a crowd and not stick out. And then one day, his sister passed away from an undetected brain aneurysm. And he said he remembers the look of sorrow in his parents' eyes. And at that point, he said to himself, I want to make my life count double. And he said it was the first time he also asked himself, what can I do? So he started to ask himself, and that is a really powerful question. I know in my research, in my journey, um, 
it seems so simple and it seems so trite, but very few people stop and ask themselves, what can I do? A lot of times it has a very hard or terrifying answer, very challenging answer. And in Warren's What Can I Do mission, um, he was the first person in his family to go to college. And he not only graduated, he went on to receive a PhD in education. He spent a lot of time either working or volunteering in the coal mines of West Virginia um, or um, in the poverty-stricken areas of Cuba. So with that, he became a questioner. And one of the things he asked himself is what I can do, and he applied that to the Appalachian Trail. But I think the most important lesson, he teaches a lot of lessons in here, but I think and I'm really glad he's the first person portrayed in the book because the most important thing Warren has taught me is that despite my, my drive for endurance and perseverance, sometimes stopping is absolutely the right decision. And I remember when I had my shin splints on the record, Warren was there helping us and I came to this place on the trail where he had, he had come in to check on me and I was in a ton of pain and I looked at him and I said, how do you know when it's time to quit? And he said, there's a difference between quitting and stopping. And that's all he said, there was no judgment to it. But I got up and I kept going because I knew, I mean, he said that and I just knew in my heart in that moment, if I didn't continue, I would be quitting. And I wanted to ask him more about that afterwards um, and in doing the research. And he is someone who, um, it's really interesting. He, he is somewhat disgusted by the fact that only one in four people will complete the trail because he says it's due to a lack of preparation. And the reason most people get off is not because of gear, is not because of injury. It's because they haven't emotionally or momentally prepared for the trail. And so he offers this course, which I took, and his completers actually have roughly a 75% chance of finishing the trail if they go through his workshop and start it. And then he's, he's led over 10 expeditions on the trail where they're basically group trips with fan support up the Appalachian Trail. And in his time doing that over four decades, there's only been one person who hasn't made it to the end who is committed to the group. So he has very high success rates. And yet he says, at times, stopping is absolutely the right decision. So I said, well, how do you know? Like, we're going through this interview. How do you know? How do you know when it's stopping and when it's quitting? And he said, well, ultimately, it's very personal. And it's based on the individual. But when you know it's right in your heart, it's stopping. And when you wish you had kept going, it's quitting. And in matters of endurance, stopping can and often will be the absolute right decision. I love that. I love it. I love Warren. Um, so I'm going to read a paragraph from the last chapter to kind of close out our formal presentation. And then I'll take a few minutes of Q&A. And I'll be sure to sort of summarize some of these findings with my first answer. And this paragraph, to me, really gets to the heart of the book. And Bruce not here to defend himself. Um, he is mentioned. He sounds a little snarky, but you met him. He's wonderful most of the time. When Brew and I are in the car and we pass a runner or walker on the sidewalk, it is natural for my husband to make comments about how fast or slow they're going and what their stride looks like. Ugh. My rule of thumb is that you never judge someone else's pace or form because you don't know how far they've come or what they're still planning to do. We all have our long trails, and most of them do not include much hiking or running. Outside the forest, our paths take the form of higher education, climbing out of debt, navigating a career, staying married, undergoing divorce, surviving tragedy, and coping with illness. And it helps us all to not come to quick conclusions about other people's paths, and instead approach each individual with encouragement and compassion. Because we might be on different trails, but we are all mid-journey.
Thank you. All right, so we'll do a few minutes of Q&A, and the first I heard was to sort of summarize this research. Um, I will tell you what I was surprised by. I went into this thinking, this is gonna be so useful. What I'm gonna do is interview these people and find all their similarities, and then basically just write up the formula for endurance, and then we all follow these steps, and we're all better creatures of endurance. And I got to the end, and I was overwhelmed by the differences. There were very few commonalities between these individuals. They had different approaches, different backgrounds, different support systems. Um, they had different reasons for doing what they did. They had different mantras or motivations for getting through their lowest points. They were very different. And, and at first, <laughs> you know, I was disappointed because that's not what I wanted. And then ultimately, I find it extremely encouraging that there is not one path to endurance. And the commonalities I did find among these people, A, at their lowest points, they have to hold on to hope. That is a basic when it comes to endurance. Um, David Horton, he said it, um, it's one of his kind of phrases he uses, but he said, when things were their worst, I would always say, um, what is it? Things can't. things can't always get worse, is what he would tell himself. And I think it's not grammatically correct, but it's the idea of it will get better. If you keep going, it cannot always get worse. At some point, things will turn. Um, so I think there is a um, deep grasp of hope within these individuals. And then I also, um, it was interesting. I didn't really get this till the end. Um, Scott Jurek was the last guy I interviewed, and he was my my hardest interview. I, he was very limited with his time, and he's also very polished and very professional, and I felt like I wasn't getting the vulnerability from him I had gotten from other people in the book, and I didn't want to just regurgitate things that had already been written about him, so I was struggling about whether or not I could include him. Um, and then I had the idea to interview his wife. And then I got to know Scott Jarrett. And uh, it was wonderful to hear his story through her perspective. And they were also a team when they set their record. And um, you know, hearing about his wife's support of him and love for him, and hearing Scott say how he never could have done it without Jenny, his wife. And you heard that. That was such a big part of my story. And then it kind of hit me that everyone in here, and not everyone had on-trail support. Some of them were setting self-supported records. So they were resupplying themselves along the way. But every single person in here said at some point, I could have never done what I did without this one person, if not more. And sometimes it was a spouse working at home to pay the mortgage so they could live their dreams. Or sometimes it was a parent who always encouraged them and always pushed them. Or sometimes it was a loved one or a best friend on trail. But everyone in here said, I never could have accomplished what I did without support. So I think hope and support are the two main findings or commonalities or similarities I found when I was looking at what makes for great efforts of endurance. Yeah. Other questions? Um, you mentioned that Warren would get upset at conservation groups, and I was wondering what conservation groups might be doing out on the trails. <laughs> well, let me say this. Warren does not get upset with conservation groups. Right. Conservation right. groups right. get upset with Warren. Warren right. is like so even keeled. Um, he's that, but he's that guy. And I'm really good friends with him, and I don't want him at my talks. Like He's going to ask that question at the end that's like, well, how do I respond to that? Um, so, yeah, I think there's, um, he considers a lot of the conservation groups, he'll say they, um, quote unquote, sanitize a lot of the information about the trail, or in other words, they spin it to make themselves or the trail look better or different than it is. He thinks a lot of times, um, you know, nonprofits or conservation groups are, are focused a lot on, on funding and donors and not always the people who, who use or live right beside the trail. Um, he, I would say, has maybe a bigger issue. Man, yeah, that's not fair. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you two examples. He climbed Katahdin, the northernmost mountain on the trail, um, when it was closed. 
as an act of civil dis disobedience because he believed the mountain was overregulated and it shouldn't be up to um, the, the three person authority that run the park to say when or when or um, basically to dictate when wilderness could be open and available. That's what I'll say. So he, he went to jail and he even wrote a poem during his time in jail <laughs> about how, you know, Katahdin, which means mighty mountain in the native tongue, was being disgraced because of all the permits and fees and regulations and policies that now surrounded it. And, you know, when a Smoky Mountain um, National Park Ranger tries to ask for his permit for camping there, he'll say, what gives you the authority to see a permit? And they'll say, I work for the U.S. government. And he'll go, well, what, give, what gives the U.S. government authority to see my permit? And they'll go, it's the U.S. government. And, you know, he'll say, yeah, and they're the ones that took this land by eminent domain from the poor Scotch-Irish farmers who used to live here. And they were the ones who took this land from the Cherokee who made their first home here. And you guys, the government, are the ones who paved a road and put a cement tower on the highest point in this park. So what authority do you have to tell me I can't lay here on my foam pad and sleep tonight? So, you know, he says it all very like calmly and nicely, but people are like, ah, we're in, ah. Uh, but he's so, I mean, I think it's, he's one of the few people I've met who I'm like, wow, he really is an independent thinker and he has made me question so much and I don't agree with him on so many things and yet I so value him. I so value him. Yeah. One or two more questions. Sure. After being on the trail for a long time, coming back to civilization, do you have a sensory overload with yeah. how society is? And how long does that usually take to kind of what? Uh, that's a great question. I struggle the most with multitasking and, and the speed of just transportation. Like the speed of travel is hard for me when I come off trail. And everything you miss just when you drive or fly or do whatever, it feels unnatural. And then the multitasking, like my brain feels the same way. It's like, this is too fast. I can't process all this. Um, so it does fade. I would say it takes, um, I don't know, maybe a few months for me to really kind of readapt or readjust. Um, but I've been fortunate. I have a lot of friends who have struggled heavily with either identity or depression coming on and off trail. And for the most part, I adjust fairly well. Um, I'm always really happy to see my showers. Love showers and my friends and my family. And I always know the trail's going to be there. And so I start planning a next adventure. And maybe it's a year away, maybe it's for a week or whatever, but it's out there and that helps too. What's your question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said that you weren't really raised you know, outdoors, but you obviously have kids and you mentioned that you've been raising them outdoors. What kinds of things do you do with them to like cultivate a love for nature when they're young? So, we have taken my daughter outside since she was a week old, and we have hiked everywhere with her. And she right now refuses to hike, refuses, which is great, because we wrote a whole book about how to get your family outside. And my daughter right now at five and a half is like, I like urban walking by stores. That's what she said. I like urban hiking by stores. And um, so, you know, wh what we do is we expose her to it and we don't force her to do it. Like she's boycotted it. And so we're not pushing her down the trail right now. Um, my husband and I, for the past two months of our book tour, we have let the kids just play at the trailhead and we've taken turns going trail running. And that's how we've experienced trails, which we thought were going to be family hikes and they weren't. Um, and today we went, oh, it was really fun. We went paddling down at the Argo... Oh, they loved it. Uh, granted, she didn't have to walk. So she, you know, they loved it. But I think it's just you expose it and you encourage it. And it's a part of family culture. And, you know, she doesn't have to hike, but she's going to have to play at the trailhead while mom and dad hike, you know. And at some point, she'll, she'll take it or leave it. But I think she'll hopefully appreciate it and she'll feel safe outdoors and she'll know it's there. And I think my greatest hope, yes, I would love my daughter to go on hikes with us. And it would be great if it's a positive outlet in her life. But what I want way more than that is for her to find something that she loves and that lights her up. And it might not be trails. Um, I could see her really loving you know, drama and art and dance and um, all those wonderful things. And so you know, I think she'll end up exposing me to a lot. 
And so I don't know. That's the, that's the answer. I don't know. I don't know. But I've written a book on it, if, if you're interested. <laughs> All right, I think there's one more question over here, and that'll be our last. Yeah. Oh, it's hard. And I feel like um, it's harder when you have kids, too. It was a lot easier to keep my basics very minimal, I feel like, and not have this idea of how much money I have to have until I had kids. And now I think the provider part kicks in, and you feel like they have to have certain things for you to be a good parent. So I don't know. It's, it's a really good question. I will say I'm really grateful to have um, a lot of close friends in my life, and many of them are from long-distance trails who do not live traditional lifestyles and remind me on a daily basis that that's okay. You know, I think we get locked into this idea of... Um, what's right and what's responsible and what's um, productive, and we all just fall in line. And the truth is for me, like, I'm pretty happy with a traditional lifestyle too. Like, we have a house that I really like when we're there, and I love having kids, and I love work. I love what I do, and I wanna do it well. And I am competitive, so I, yeah, you know, I do wanna beat the other people. But on the other hand, I don't want my life and my time and my toil to be all spent towards just earning money or being competitive, because there is so much more. So I'm so grateful to people who have created other types of lives. And I think we look down on them quite often instead of like learning from their example. So I do have a lot of hiker friends that work seasonal jobs and save up ten to $15,000 and then spend half the year hiking. And that's what they live on all year. Um, and I have people who in my life have spent a lot of time doing, doing things, service projects like um, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, um, or people who you know, don't adhere to one career path but kind of jump around and make that part of their adventures. And they're not afraid to take time off. Um, and they're not afraid to reinvent themselves. And I think that's really beautiful and powerful because I do feel like especially after having kids, you feel really concerned about things like um, their formation and education and uh, what you're doing for health insurance and what you're doing to make sure things are going to be okay. So I'm just, I think I'm learning more from other friends. And there's a lot of people in this book who are good examples of that. Um, so on that note, we'll go ahead and um, wrap up in here for this evening. If you are interested in the new book, um, there's a table outside and the local bookstore has graciously brought their copies and then I will sit back there um, and I'm happy to sign books. Um, you do not have to buy a book to come back. You're welcome to come visit. You're welcome to come ask questions that didn't get addressed in here. Um, I'm happy to do photos if you want those. And then, um, you know, a, if you're interested in following our adventures, um, you can A, come see us in North Carolina, although Bob, you know we're never there, um, but we might be there. Or um, we're also online and you can find us on social media. But um, we've loved, we have really loved our time in Ann Arbor and thank you guys for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. This program was recorded on August 8th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.